Think not, the Lord came to be peace on this earth. He came, give us a sword. Shalom in the name of the Lord, everybody. We'll go to Time of Night, Watchmen. Time of Night, Watchmen, a time of commentary, information, Bible, prophecy, and stuff. It's been noted to me that I've been talking much too fast, and people are not able to keep up with me. Well, that's okay! <laughs> but I'm going to address a certain issue today, something that's come up this past week. You know, I always get inspired by my closest friends, because they tend to draw things out of me that seems very pertinent. In light of my personality, my character, and above all, God. You know, God, big G, little d, God. So this is the topic for today is having higher expectations. You know, I just, I do. I, I have high expectations. And uh, it, it, it because, you know, the Bible lends itself when it comes to having expectations. God has higher expectations of us. I mean, gee, almighty God sends forth his only begotten son, to die on the cross for our sins. You talk about stepping it up by several notches. Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, died for your sins. Crucified. Brutally. Brutally beaten. Brutally crucified. So the stakes are pretty high, don't you think? I mean, as a dad, you know, if my son went off to war, and in that warring he, he saved millions of lives at the detriment of his own life, and then you go to his funeral or wake or whatever gathering you have, and you talk down about him, you know what, I'm going to be, be a little bit ticked off. My son, he died so many would live. Yeah, that's a bit disrespectful. Now, if that's higher expectations, I guess I'm, I'm, in, I'm in good shape here, as God himself has higher expectation. So what does God expect? We look at Matthew 7, 21. It says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who do what my Father in heaven wants. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy your name? Didn't we expel demons in your name? Didn't we perform many miracles in your name? Then I will tell them to their faces, I never knew you. Get away from me, you workers of lawlessness. Hmm. This, of course, comes from the complete Jewish Bible. King James would be a little bit different. The word is iniquity, which also means lawlessness. Well, think about that. It says here, did we not prophesy? In that? Well, who prophesies? Who prophesies these days? Well, Christians normally prophesy. I see people prophesy every day. Christians. Do we not expel demons? In the name of Jesus, are we not able to expel demons? I mean, are we not, as Christians, participate and partake in miracles and wonderful works? Yet, in the end of this, he never knew you. Depart from me, ye who work iniquity or lawlessness. God has expectations. If we don't meet up with those expectations, what do you think is going to happen? Let's go further. And only a few will find it. I mean, that's the scripture here in Matthew 7, 14. But it is a narrow gate and a hard road that leads to life. And only a few who find it. A narrow gate and a hard road that leads to life. Why is it hard? You have the world going against you. You have your flesh going against you. You have demonic spirits going against you. This is not an easy task. You have your family, close friends, neighbors, pastors, ministers, preachers, teachers, and the list goes on. They're going against you. Yeah. It's hard. Sometimes it's even lonely. Sometimes you have to step out and get away from the very things that are pulling down into the abyss. And we're going to get more into that. It's a hard road. But you know what? Nothing good comes out of something that's soft. Good things come out of things that are hard. You know that if you see the making of a sword, a steel or metal sword, it's hard. It's a challenge. And that's what God is challenging us to do. Bring up the game. Now, this is not going to be easy, folks. God has higher expectations of us. Because Jesus not just died on the cross for our sins, but he has given us the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. I mean, it does not the scripture say we can do all things through Christ Jesus? So what excuses do we have to offer to God in light of these truths? 
But yet, people's excuses are many. I'll never forget when I was in the military, basic training. You know, I messed up. And I, I try to explain my messing up, if you will. And my TI would say to me, you have no excuse. And that's the only thing you want to hear out of my mouth. I have no excuse, sir. You have no excuse. You have no excuse. I have not read the Bible from front to back. You have no excuse for not doing your study. You have no excuse for not stepping out there. You have no excuse giving in to fear. You have no excuse. No excuse. But all they do is offer excuses. Oh, I didn't know. <laughs> Come on. Really? Oh, it was my mom and dad's fault. Oh, be up, my favorite one. God, well, you created me. You have no excuse. And only a few will find it, it says. Hard road. So what does it take to make it to the Super Bowl? I think this is a good, good, good portrayal example of what it is to be born again Christian. What does it take? I mean, do you think you just one day, boop, you're at a Super Bowl and you're, you're doing great stuff and performing great works, if you will, and winning it for the team? Or is there more to it? Well, clearly there's a lot more to it. Of course, there's strength in character, loyalty, honor, nobility, faith above all things, and integrity. Do, do, do you think Jesus died on the cross for you to just throw away that salvation he's given you? I mean, God gives you salvation. What are you going to do with it? Didn't that term say to work out your salvation? So are we not put to the task? Or some say feet put to the fire. Strength and character, loyalty, honor, nobility, faith, integrity. And granted, all these things don't come overnight. It's something you have to work out. Something you have to work for. Just as it is to get to the Super Bowl and win. Greater expectation God has. Or you could be, like I said, one of those people who just don't do the due diligence. They don't do the works God tells them. Study to show yourself approved. It's amazing how many people don't do the basic, basic things about God and what he says. I've read my Bible front to back, and I'm still participating in Bible study. Well, what are you doing? I'm also applying the very things I'm studying. I'm applying it to my life. I'm growing and I'm maturing. You know, and the Super Bowl is coming, folks, and that's as the return of Jesus Christ. And if anything, we're in that right now. But, you know, people give in to compromise. People say, I have an excuse. Let's see how far those excuses go. You go to the book of Revelation. Interesting enough, five out of the seven churches, they don't make it. Unless, of course, they repent. Let's look at Ephesus. It says, but I have this against you. You have lost the love you had at first. Therefore, remember where you were before you fell. Turn from this sin and do what you used to do before. Otherwise, I will come to you and remove your menorah from its place. That's the Holy Spirit, by the way. If you don't turn from your sin, but you have this in your favor, you hate what the Nicolaitans do. I hate it too. So, you know, we have some little leeway here. People call that mercy and grace, and it's true. But, you know... If you have this against those people who are not doing what they're supposed to be doing and they have sin running rampant in their life, it becomes apparent that God's expectations are not being met by these people. And I'm sure, like today, they have excuses. Look at Pergamum. He says, nevertheless, I have a few things against you. You have some people who hold to the teaching of Bilaam, who taught Balak to set a trap for the people of Israel. So that they would eat food that had been sacrificed to idols and commit sexual sin. Likewise, you too have people who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore, turn from this these sins. You're sinning against the Holy God. We talked about this before. The wages of sin is death. So what's your excuse? Everything's there. Everything in the Bible is as directions. Even told to hearken and listen to the voice of God. What's your excuse for sinning against a holy God? You didn't know? Or you're just too lazy? Well, that would be slothful, would it be not? Too lazy to read a Bible. And I've heard the excuses. Well, I don't know how to read. 
That's your excuse? You never picked up a book, a CD, a DVD, a tape recording, and listened? You never took a study course in hopes to read and able to read and communicate with one another? I mean, we have more excuses than excuses, but the bottom line is God has a higher expectation of you. And then again, there's a scripture. We can do all things through Christ Jesus. So unable to read a Bible from front to back, that's no excuse. It's no excuse. Then as Thyatira, but I have this against you. Continue to tolerate that Jezebel woman, the one who claims to be a prophet or prophetess, but is teaching and deceiving my servants to commit sexual sin and eat food that has been sacrificed to idols. I've seen that today in today's churchianity, between Easter and Christmas and all that other nonsense. <clears throat> I gave her time to turn from her sin, but she doesn't want to repent of her immorality. So I am throwing her into a sick bed, and those who commit adultery with her I am throwing into great trouble. Unless they turn from the sins connected with what she does... And I will strike her children dead. Then all the Messianic communities will know that I am the one who searches minds and hearts. And that I will give to each of you what your deeds deserve. Thyatira. What was their excuse? Lord, Lord, did we not all do all these things in that day? And God will say, I never knew you. Depart from me, he who do iniquity. Lawlessness. Then it's Sardis, I know what you're doing. You have a reputation for being alive. I see this all the time too. But in fact, you're dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains before it dies too. For I found what I have doing incomplete in the sight of my God. So remember what you received and heard and obey it and turn from your sin. For if you don't wake up, I will come like a thief. And you don't know at what moment I will come upon you. I mean, I see this, especially in the, in the uh, Pentecostal churches, the big yip, yip, yap, yap, screaming aloud churches, the noisy ones. I, I see this as, this, this is Sardis. Maybe you just sit down, shut up, and hearken to the voice of God, and humble yourself before him. Maybe, maybe you'll start getting things right. I mean, scream and holler and shout, all that does is try to keep God's voice from being heard. You know, it's like going to these football games and these cheerleaders show up. All they are is a distraction. Especially to us guys. Well, let's face it. It's a distraction. It's amazing. And again, what's the excuse? You know, you, you, you perform. You entertain. You put up smokes, mirrors, light shows, the works. And yet you never hearken unto the voice of God. It's a sad testament. I see that right here in this town as well, too. It's not the only place. I mean, I've seen abroad. We've traveled quite a bit. Uh, then, of course, is Laodicea. I know what you're doing. You're neither cold nor hot. How you wish you were either one or the other. So because you're lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, <coughs> <excuse me. coughs> I will vomit you out of my mouth, for you keep saying, I am rich. I have gotten rich. I don't need a thing. You don't know that you are the one who is wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I'm take a moment for a drink here. Laodicea. What's your excuse? I mean, it's easy to give in to the ways of the world. I mean, you know, it's easy. It's easy to give in to sin, but that's a hard road. You will have challenges. And that's what makes this walk so interesting. You are to be challenged. You are to be sharpened. You know, iron versus iron. Yeah. But yet, you know, we want it easy. We want the easy way. Let's all get along. And the truth is we cannot. God makes distinction between good and evil, right from wrong. Even, even the scripture says, what does light have to do with darkness? And vice versa. Yeah, we compromise ourselves. And for what reason? To keep the peace? Reminds me of the scripture. Peace, Yehu? Peace? When your whoredom of your mother's Jezebel runs rampant throughout all of Israel? Yeah. 
There is no peace. There's no peace unless there's peace with the Almighty God through Jesus Christ, Yeshua Mashiach. That's Laodicea. And of course, you know, again, expectation is Smyrna. I know how you are suffering, how poor you are, though in fact you are rich. And I know the insults of those who call themselves Jews but aren't. There's something about that I just learned about recently. It's quite interesting about that. They are a synagogue of the adversary. Don't be afraid of what you are about to suffer. Look, the adversary is going to have some of you thrown in prison in order to put you to the test. You'll face an ordeal for ten days. Remain faithful, even to the point of death, and I'll give you life as your crown. Smyrna. These are people who make it. These are people who are determined to make it to the Super Bowl, if you will. This is Smyrna. One of the two surviving churches, especially in the end days. Then it's Philadelphia. I know what you're doing. Look, I have put in front of you an open door, and no one could shut it. I know that you have but little power, yet you have obeyed my message and have not disowned me. Here I will give you some from the synagogue of the adversary, those who call themselves Jews but aren't. Because you did obey my message about preserving, I will keep you from the time of trial coming upon the whole world to put the people living on earth to the test. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take away your crown. A surviving church. A surviving mindset. They're doing exactly what God called them to do. They observe the law and commandments of God. They hearken unto his voice. And even though the challenges become hard, it doesn't make them impossible. Remember, I never placed anything before you that you cannot overcome. Think about that. Philadelphia. We've talked about Philadelphia prophetically at the turning of the Revolutionary War. But that's a previous video. Which church are you? Seven churches. Where do you stand in the sight of God? It's a competition. Let's face it. And what do you do for a competition? You work out, you try out, you compete. It's that plain and simple. Relatively. The instructions are simple. The road is hard. But have you ever seen a, a football team or a runner or anybody else not have to work out in order to win the gold medal? It takes time, it takes patience, it takes hard work to get to the goal on our part. In a lot of places, I just don't see that anymore. I hear excuses. I mean, it's, it's, it's a sad testimony. And that brings out another part. Where is your testimony? When you're not walking in the fullness of God's words, what is your testimony? If Jesus Christ has saved you from sin... And yet you're still dabbling in the things of this world. You're still involved in the things of this world. And you've compromised your soul. And where is your testimony? And if you're free, afraid to stand up for what is right in the sight of God. If you're afraid for, of persecution. If you're afraid what your neighbors are going to say about you. Then again, where is your testimony? When it comes down to it. What are you willing to sacrifice? How far are you willing to go? There are no trophies for second place. And there's nowhere else to go but down. But, you know, there, there are those people. They just don't have it in them for some reason. Nor do they ask for it. Think about it. All you have to do is ask for it from God. God, give me the strength. God, give me the power. God, move me in your ways. Your ways. Teach me your truth. Don't allow me to fall into compromise. This schlock we see today in today's churchianity, it's nothing short of disgusting. You're talking about low expectations. If that's your expectation, there's something fundamentally wrong with you. I mean, I've seen it even here in Oklahoma. A church has been given over to Satan. 
because they're not willing to repent, we talked about that in the five churches, they're unwilling to repent from the sin. They're unwilling to make the change. Just like recently, they want to improve the decor of their church, make it look prettier. You think God cares what your church looks like? You should be falling into obedience with him. Getting on your hands and knees and just that, repenting. Walking in his ways, not the world's ways. You think God wants us to entertain? <laughs> There's nothing entertaining about hell. I have news for you. I've seen it for myself and you're not going to like it. I have seen it. Too many times, God leaves the building. And now in this case, how churches have been given over to Satan. Literally. You think this is God's house, even though you invoke the name Jesus Christ? No. You think there's the Holy Spirit dwelling there, lifting you up? No. It's something else. Because believe me, the devil could come like an angel of light and seem to appear as God. And look how easy we are distracted and get perturbed and how I'm demonized because how dare I question the authority of churchianity. And some of these pastors are nothing but a bunch of little girls. They don't know how to stand in a gap. They don't know what it is to go through the fire. That's the very warning God gave me when I asked him about what, what is a tribulation going to be like for us. And he said, like Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, we shall walk through the fire. High expectations? You know I do. Because you know what? God has that as well, too. Remember, he only gave his only begotten son. Died upon the cross for our sins. You think that he's let go of? That he just thinks it is nothing? I've seen people how they say, oh, my suffering is so great. Look at me. Look at me. How is that compared to Jesus Christ? The self-edification is self-idolatry. It's disgusting in the presence of a holy God. Expectations? Which one do you choose? I have higher expectations. I had higher expectations of God, and he did not disappoint as God has higher expectations of me. Considering all the promises, everything I've read, studied, and applied in my life, His Word, the expectations are high. You want to compromise yourself? You want to just go along to get along? Fake it till you make it? Yeah, those are lower expectations. Yeah, I hope and pray to God this reaches whoever's here and needs to hear this because... In light of the circumstances, it's not going to bode well for you. Remember, God has higher expectations. This is Time of Night Watch, but Time of Night Watch, Time of Commentary, Information, Bible, Prophecy, Stuff. See ya. Don't want to be ya. And remember, there's only one way, one truth, and one life. In Jesus' name, amen.